Good morning. Thanks to everyone for coming to uh, what turns, to about a, turns out to be an even more timely and appropriate program than we thought. Uh, I want to first of all thank Mr. Ken Garcina of Mason Capital, who's our sponsor for this event, along with an anonymous donor too, but Ken is the, Ken is the man, and uh, in addition to being uh, one of the two most successful Austro hedge fund managers in this country, the other one being Steve Berger, who we'll introduce a little bit later. Um, he was also a student of Walter Block's. He got his economics degree under Walter and went on to, uh, to great success. So Ken, we want to thank you very, very much for doing this and for all your generosity and uh, for the work you do for our ideas in general, as well as, of course, uh, helping people be successful in these crazed Fed times. Uh, yeah, absolutely. So for our keynote speaker this morning, we're honored to have Mr. David Stockman. Uh, I first knew David back when he was a congressman and I was working for Ron Paul, and I can tell you, uh, as you can imagine, the people who worked for Ron Paul didn't have much respect for the other congressmen. Uh, but there was one guy we respected for his intelligence and his principles, and that was David Stockman, and we were thrilled to be able to work with him against the draft. David, they're bringing that up again now, so you're going to have to get back to work, but it's, uh, and, and other civil liberties issues and financial issues. Uh, he was hired away from Congress by the Reagan administration. Uh, they correctly thought he was the smartest guy on the budget and, and uh, governmental financial matters. Uh, David found out that uh, they weren't actually interested in cutting anything. They weren't actually, they were actually interested in massive deficits and of course uh, we're all shocked to know that a politician was, was lying, including Ronald Reagan. Uh, David left. He wrote uh, a book called The Triumph of Politics, an extraordinary book, uh, unfortunately out of print, but I think one of the great books ever written about uh, how the government actually works. Um, he's been a very successful uh, investment banker, uh, many charitable activities. Uh, right now he's writing his second book called The Great Deformation on how uh, the Fed and the rest of the government is messing up the economy, destroying the future, and what we can do about it. So, David's going to talk about that subject this morning, and David, it's an honor to have you here. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, and uh, good morning. Uh, until yesterday, actually, Lou, I had been thinking this would be an ideal occasion to deliver a very erudite and philosophical summary of this uh, book I've been working on now for a couple of years. Um, and then yesterday happened, and the Fed did it again, and I ended up thinking, uh, this is the final abomination. This has gone too far. I'm it's street fighting time. Uh, this is beyond the pale. <laughs> I mean, it's on diluted lunacy. It's QEI, quantitative easing forever, which means we're going to print ourselves to death uh, as an economy. And so uh, instead of the erudite philosophical view of how capitalism is being destroyed uh, by statist philosophies of one type or another, I'm going to launch into a full, full strength tirade about the Fed, just in case anybody's interested. And I think you have to start by saying, before you get into any of the obvious issues, the problem today is the Fed is being run by the single most dangerous man ever to hold high office in the history of the United States. And I would say, in fact, he is more dangerous than most of the other well-known culprits that I can think of put together. He is more dangerous than Geithner, than Larry Summers, than Alan Greenspan, then Hank Paulson all put together, we would have to reach back, throw in a few old timers like William G. Miller and Arthur J. Burns, and we still wouldn't be there. In fact, I'd have to go all the way back to Mariner Eccles uh, to come up with a package that could uh, add up to the damage he's doing. As a matter of fact, when you think of what's happening today and what this Fed is doing, you almost wish that Mariner Eccles would come back to life and that we could put him back in, the ch in charge of the Fed, because at least, and some of you may know your history, you read a lot of this stuff, I know, at least you would know that Mariner, Mariner Eccles, who was the first modern chairman of the Fed in 1935, was a 
uh, Keynesian, no doubt, uh, early for his time, but he was a fiscal Keynesian who actually believed that money printing was bad, that it would fuel speculation, and that if the government was going to rob the people, it should do it the honest way with taxes. Now, that was, uh, that was Mariner Eccles back in 1935, and uh, you know today, when you look at what the Fed is doing, robbing the people in so many different ways, uh, you almost uh, wish that he uh, would come back. So I want to uh, kind of do an indictment here. I'm going to tick off a few things, and I'm sure I'll miss a few, and maybe if there's some Q&A time, we can cover them. First, it's obvious that this is the death of capital and money markets. There is no doubt about it. The capital markets do not, in money markets, they don't price anything anymore. They don't discount any future. They don't allocate capital anymore. All of this is simply a vast, frenzied trading against the last maneuver and the last uh, utterance of the Fed. After all, if interest rates uh, in the money markets are going to remain zero through mid to uh, 14 or 15 now, that's six years of zero interest rates. How in the world can anybody believe uh, that when you have three, two or three percent inflation as measured officially, and probably a lot more than that if measured honestly, that six years worth of holding the interest rate to zero has not completely destroyed and savaged any capacity of interest rates to signal things and to perform the price function that is essential in capital markets. Uh, likewise, how can anyone believe if they're going to be massively intervening in the so-called middle of the market, buying 40 billion of MBS a month, and on top of that continuing operation twist at about that amount how can anyone believe any longer that the yield curve means anything? The yield curve is supposed to mean something. That is the heart of the fixed income market. It is the heart, really, of the capitalist economy of the world. And now it is being explicitly, um, you know, unabashedly, uh, uh, in totally acknowledged way, being manipulated and twisted and uh, torqued and turned in order to meet some fanciful notion that the Fed uh, uh, Open Market Committee has, the Monetary Politburo, as I call it, but certainly without a yield curve in the fixed income market, which is tens of trillions worldwide, uh, the, the uh, markets uh, obviously uh, can't function. And the same is true of equity prices. They don't discount uh, company earnings anymore. They simply discount the next uh, Fed press release. When you have interest rates suppressed to this level, the 10-year, the central rate in the world market, the 10-year U.S. Treasury pushed down to 1.7, 1.6, 1.5, and their goal is to even lower it more, although it backfired on them yesterday. Uh, when you do that, that interest rate, which is the fundamental pricing mechanism of the capital markets, is the reciprocal of asset values. And so by definition, the more you push down the long-term interest rate, the more you're flating, inflating the value of every asset class that you can think of, uh, both uh, financial assets, real, uh, real estate, commodities, and so forth. And so therefore, the effect of this interest rate uh, repression or financial repression is to misprice all the asset classes in the world. And that then uh, is another part uh, of the witch's brew that's uh, uh, emerging out of this. So when you put all that together and you say the yield curve doesn't mean anything, interest rates don't mean anything, asset prices uh, are totally, uh, uh, assets are totally mispriced, the equity market is simply uh, uh, trading the Fed, what, what it means is that you've completely hollowed out and destroyed the capital market. In effect, in a metaphorical sense, there is no one home on Wall Street. There are simply computers trading word clouds with each other emitted by this central bank or that. And uh, the obvious point is, how can you have a capitalist economy how can you uh, restore capitalist vibrancy and growth and all of the things that even uh, the Romney campaign is talking about 
if you've destroyed the capital markets which are at the center, which are at the heart, which are the lifeblood of the capitalist system. I don't think you can, and that's why I think that in the long run, this central bank issue is not simply about printing too much money or some hyperinflation down the road or even what I've talked about here, the clear and total distortion uh, of financial markets and the price signal. This is really about the uh, destruction of capitalism from the center out. Because if the central bank destroys the financial markets, uh, capitalism uh, is going to languish. And then the people will blame the bad outcome uh, on capitalism. And then legislative uh, action uh, will add even more. Now, um, the one way to look at this, uh, in terms of, and all of you are aware of this, but how addictive, addicted the capital markets have become to the latest nuance and move and maneuver uh, and slight change in statement of the uh, Open Market Committee and the Fed is a study probably some of you have seen, but in this particular morning after yesterday in the uh, crazy reaction that occurred in the risk asset markets around the world, this is really a good statistic. Somebody went out and went back and sorted the movement in the S&P 500 from uh, early, or I think mid-1994, when Greenspan finally began to go off the deep end. It took him a couple of years, but uh, he, he uh, ended up way off the deep end. But anyway, if you take that point until yesterday, the S&P 500 index, which is, after all, the measure uh, of the heartland, let's say, of risk assets, went from 425 value in early 94 to 1460 yesterday. But if you remove from that 18-year history each 24-hour period before uh, the F FOMC uh, met, then the index did not quadruple from 400, roughly, uh, to uh, 13, uh, 1460, but it went from 425 to 600. In other words, in the whole 18 years, the S&P 500 went up at about 2% a year, except in the 24-hour segments before the 12 or, t uh, I mean, the 9 or 10 uh, FOMC meetings a year, all the rest of the gain. So 85% of the gain occurred uh, in the 24-hour windows uh, before each Fed meeting. So we have a Fed-run economy. There is absolutely no doubt about that. And, and I, as I say, when the Fed is running the con economy, uh, capitalism can't survive. Second, I think it should be obvious that this also means the death of fiscal governance, if we're not already there already. Um, and I think uh, we're doing, uh, they're doing a pretty miserable job. But when you tell the uh, Capitol Hill and when you tell the congressmen, even some of them that might uh, uh, wish uh, uh, to be you know, marginally responsible, when you tell them that you can borrow one year at 15 basis points, which you can this morning, or three years at 35 basis points, or out to five years at 75 basis points, for, from Washington's point of view, that's a rounding error. That's close enough to free not to worry about the carry cost of the debt. And so they don't, and so they kick the can, so they defer the tough issues. What congressman really of either party, uh, and no matter how corrupt he is or maybe uh, brave, wants to uh, bite the bullet, fall on the sword, disappoint constituencies if you can borrow for another year and hope things get better uh, on the margin for 40, 50, or 60 basis points, which doesn't uh, add up really to anything in the scheme of things. The problem is this interest rate uh, repression is only deferring the day when the whole thing explodes. We are now objectively at the point where we have 20 trillion of debt. I mean, they say it's 16.3, but there's so much built into the pipeline that you can say today it can't be stopped, even if we had a total miracle and change of mind, there's 20 trillion. That means that if interest rates normalize, I'm not talking about some real infl uh, you know, inflationary flare-up or some huge uh, collapse in the financial markets, which I think is going to happen, but if they just normalize, they would go up by 300 basis points because right now the weighted average cost of the federal debt is 2%. So if it went up to 5%, it would mean 
that the carry cost on the debt today is being understated by $600 billion a year. In other words, before they even begin to think about any entitlement they might reform, whether or not they could possibly see the logic of cutting defense in a world where we don't have any enemies, uh, industrial enemies left, uh, in a world where, uh, you know, Romney is waving the bloody shirt at Russia. Why? I mean, Russia is a kleptocracy. They love to steal from each other. They don't have time to steal from other people. So uh, why do we have, uh, you know, this uh, in enormous de defense budget? Uh, so what I'm saying is that even if there was some inclination to begin uh, to uh, gra uh, grapple with those issues, uh, as long as you make it so simple uh, as they are today, as the Fed is, um, to finance another increment of $100 billion a month or another trillion a year, uh, this will continue and we'll bury ourselves in even, uh, in even more debt that can't be handled. I think the third thing that came out of yesterday is that this is the real class war. Now, you hear about that and you know, hear about it all the time in the campaign. But the real class war in America is that the Fed has declared war on savers. The Fed has declared war on thrift. The Fed has declared war on the fundamental mechanism of a capitalist economy where people are rewarded for deferring consumption by saving so that that pool of savings can go into reinvestment and all the other things uh, that we know about on which a real, vibrant, growing, thriving capitalist economy is uh, built. And so we have a determined, explicit, acknowledged policy in the Eccles building at the Fed to punish and essentially destroy savers. I just saw this morning, six month CD, 40 basis points. That's all you can get. So uh, what are we telling people uh, about the future? What are we doing to people who have already retired maybe with a decent nest egg. What we're saying is that if you expect to get any return on this, as per Bernanke, you can't keep it in some place that's safe. You have to go way out on the risk spectrum, and we're making granny buy junk bonds so that she has enough uh, uh, income coming in from the nest egg that her uh, deceased husband left her so she doesn't have to you know, buy dog food for dinner. That's what this Fed uh, policy is doing and it is profoundly destructive, uh, I think, in a social sense, and is profoundly destructive in terms of everything that's wrong with our economy. We've been on a debt binge uh, for the last 30 or 40 years. Everyone knows that. There's one figure that I use over and over, and I'll repeat it today, because I think it really captures the essence of where we are and why this policy is so wrong-headed and destructive. In 1980, we had $5 trillion of debt in this country, public and private. In other words, the whole credit market debt outstanding, government, financial sector, households, business, and so forth, a GDP of $3 trillion. So the ratio, let's call it the leverage ratio of the economy, was about 1.5. Now, the interesting thing is that that leverage ratio had been at 1.5 for 100 years. You could actually go back to 1870, and the best they can put the statistics together, it was 1.5. And in between, we had war and peace and boom and bust and William Jennings Bryan and Calvin Coolidge and a lot of other things. And during that entire period, it, it was very close to that 1.5 times. It seemed to be the natural leverage ratio for an economy. Then we, went, we took off in 1980 and went to the races. Today, we have 53 trillion of total uh, credit market debt outstanding on the economy. Uh, we have a 15 trillion economy. We are now leveraged 3.5 times, uh, uh, 3.5 to one, way off the charts. You just look at it, it's a straight line in history, and then it's a hockey stick straight up. And that is a big number, I understand, but if we had stayed on the beaten path, if we had stayed on what I call the golden constant, which seems to be uh, uh, been valid historically and it was consistent with a stable economy and growth, and we were at one and a half times debt to GDP today, we would have 22 trillion of debt on the uh, uh, U.S. economy, public and private, not 53 trillion, which means that we're lugging around three tr 30 trillion of excess debt, you know, uh, in the household sector, on the business balance sheets, on the financial institutions, and more and more on government. Uh, 
And if you have that much debt and you're that far off any kind of historic norms, why would you have a policy at the central bank which is trying to force people to borrow even more and discourage people from saving when obviously uh, we're totally upside down? Uh, now, the next uh, thing that I think is coming out of this is what I would call the real triumph of crony capitalist corruption. Because when the Fed engages in this kind of central planning sense, when it is all over the market, all the time, giving out signals and manipulating every aspect of pricing in the capital markets, the yield curve, and the con con components and constituents of the yield curve. Like yesterday, the smart guys knew there were certain kinds of MBS, mortgage-backed securities, to buy because they were going to rally on the Fed's announcement that uh, uh, they were um, going to buy $40 billion a month. But there were also certain kinds of MBS to sell because these were older MBS with higher interest rates and now that the Fed is driving the mortgage rate down even lower, those are going to prepay at a higher rate than previously assumed. The negative convexity is going to eat people alive. And so yesterday, some people shorted negative con convexity and bought the MBS that the Fed is going to be buying, made a killing, and this is supposed to be a capital market. Uh, now, for some reason, Goldman Sachs uh, printed the day before exactly what the Fed was going to do. And uh, if they were so bold, I might say to uh, print it uh, in a, a message to their unwashed uh, uh, clients, I can imagine what they were telling uh, the real insiders. Now, my point is that if you saw what happened yesterday coming, and it was well telegraphed, I believe a couple of thousand people made $50 billion yesterday in 50 minutes as a result of the radical, sudden, lurching move, moves that occurred in the uh, uh, fixed income markets as a result of this announcement. The Treasury bond actually rallied, or the MBS, the uh, mainstream Fannie Mae 3% coupons, rallied in a few minutes by 1%. Now, when you realize there's about five or six trillion mortgage-backed securities, Fannie, Freddie, uh, Ginnie Mae, and then a, a couple trillion or so that are left uh, from the uh, private uh, label issuance, all of those were powerfully and massively affected yesterday by the announcement of the Fed and the smart traders were positioned, laughed all the way to the bank, and captured the windfall. Now, the reason I think that is important is I don't begrudge some guy who was smart enough to do that, but I do condemn a policy that creates random windfalls as a result of manipulation of financial markets for no better reason than some lunatic academic thinks that this is going to make capitalism better. And that's uh, exactly what we have today. Now, how are the people in America ever going to be sold on capitalism when it's so obvious the system is rigged? And I don't say that from some kind of conspiracy point of view. I say that because Wall Street is cheek by jowl with the Fed. Wall Street demanded this. Wall Street said it would have a hissy fit if they didn't do it. Bernanke is weak, and the rest of that crowd around him is even weaker. I mean, did you see the vote yesterday? Set Bernanke aside. It's 10 to 1. Ten sheep voted for this uh, abomination on the uh, open market committee. So uh, given that kind of performance, uh, it is very obvious to me that uh, our system now is simply riddled with trading windfalls, arbitrage of the next move, the next signal, uh, the next uh, slight variation uh, or of utterance that's coming out of the Fed. Uh, the next uh, part of my indictment is that uh, they have now taken money printing and bond buying so far off the deep end I can't even see it anymore. And, you know, after a while we get used to hearing, you know, 40 billion buy or QE1 uh, was 1.2, QE2 was 600 billion. Now this one is 40 billion a month, but it's really 80 because they were already buying 40 billion of MBS to replace uh, uh, the ones that are uh, rolling off. Uh, 
But let me just give a couple of statistical dimensions of this so that you can see that the Fed is all over this. It's smothering the capital markets, and there may not be anything left uh, very long if we can get to 214 when Bernanke uh, his, terms, uh, his term has expired. There couldn't be anybody worse I could, that anybody could imagine to a point, uh, I, I don't believe. But the point is, if you just look at the mortgage-backed security buying, and what are they doing in the mortgage market? We've already wrecked the housing market. We've already wrecked mortgage finance. We've already created this massive disaster that came in 205 to 208, and then in the aftermath and so forth, but now they're in there driving down the yield, driving up the price, distorting and contorting further the housing market. But here's how bad it's going to be. These, after all, everything we supposedly learned from the crisis of 207 and 208, uh, uh, Freddie, Fannie, and Ginny May are still alive and kicking down in Washington. Uh, they, they, you know, they've eaten alive about 180 billion of taxpayer money so far, but they're all uh, uh, still functioning. In fact, that's the only uh, part of the housing finance system that's left. But the point is they're still issuing 140 billion of new mortgage-backed securities a month. And with the policy announced yesterday, the Fed is going to be buying 30 billion from before, the so-called roll-off. Now it's adding 40 billion. So it's going to be buying 50% of every mortgage-backed security issued by the entire complex of these Washington-based monsters who are using the taxpayer's credit uh, to stamp guaranteed on these uh, mortgage-backed securities. 50% uh, of it now is going to be bought by the Fed. Another dimension of it is the following. I, I like this one, and I know... Uh, it's uh, something that probably a lot of you may be aware of, but I think the statistic is remarkable. The Fed opened for business in November 1914, and it took them 93 years till September 15, to be exact, 2008, to accumulate a balance sheet of $900 billion. And, you know, that was through uh, two world wars, uh, a lot of unnecessary wars, um, through uh, the Great Society, uh, Guns and Butter, through the Reagan deficit disasters that I had some uh, knowledge and familiar, familiarity with and so forth, uh, through the George Bush fiscal catastrophe uh, that we had uh, in the last eight years. But through that entire period, it took that long for the Fed to accumulate $900 billion of balance sheet, mostly government securities, you know, of one uh, maturity or another. In seven weeks of sheer panic, after Lehman went down, and the next day they found an excuse to bail out AIG when they couldn't find one the day before, in seven weeks, Bernanke doubled the size of the balance sheet of the Fed. He did in seven weeks another $900 billion that had taken 93 years uh, to uh, generate uh, in the first instance. And then in the first 13 weeks after the Lehman event, the uh, balance sheet of the Fed went to 2.5 trillion, which means uh, it almost tripled uh, in 13 weeks uh, relative to 93 years of history. So it tells you that something is way out of kilter. There is some lunatic doctrine. There are some madmen in charge of the printing press who uh, have no idea that, uh, you know, uh, simply printing money uh, can't possibly uh, cause any uh, good and will uh, most certainly generate a huge amount of bad. After all, if it were so simple as what this open market committee is saying, there's PhDs on there. I, you know, I, there's, there must be something wrong in the water supply at Princeton. I, I can't figure out, uh, you know, if you're there long enough, you must get brain damage or something. I, I can't figure out where these people uh, are coming from. But if it were so damn easy, why don't we just stop working? Why don't we just stop worrying and have the Fed print eight trillion worth of balance sheet, literally drop it out of a helicopter, as uh, Bernanke once uh, advocated, and our job would be one hour today to pick up enough money to get by and then do the rest of the day, uh, you know, 
uh, because I, I, that's where it's leading. This isn't, uh, you know, it used to be sort of on the margin. Well, you know, should you have M1 growing at 4.5% or 3? Uh, that, you know, that was a stupid debate, but at least it was fair. Now they're printing it with such reckless abandon, with such enormous magnitudes, that if this continues, there will be a $4 trillion federal balance sheet, uh, by, I mean, a Federal Reserve balance, $4 trillion Federal Reserve balance sheet uh, by uh, 2014 when hopefully uh, Bernanke's term will be up. Uh, obviously, uh, the uh, point that is clear to everyone is that what's happening at the Fed today is Keynesian financial central planning on steroids. And the worst thing is, it's done by 12, 12 unelected members of the Federal Open Market Committee who therefore don't have to answer to anyone. Uh, and they have long terms. And so it's even worse than the old style fiscal Keynesianism that uh, you got from Samuelson and all the rest of them, because at least then, Lyndon Johnson had to go to Congress and try to persuade them to run these deficits, and they were reluctant to do it. Uh, even, uh, you know, back then, even Nixon, who uh, was totally out of control on the fiscal issue, said, we're all Keynesians now, but he even, uh, at one point, uh, had to cut spending and raise taxes because uh, it took at least some uh, democratic assent. But today, we have 12 people who are self-appointed monetary central planners who believe they're in charge of the entire economy, who have no clue that they don't know what the real growth potential of the US economy is with 53 trillion worth of debt on top of it, with a leverage ratio of three and a half rather than one and a half after doing a 30-year national LBO. How do they know what the growth, real growth potential is of the economy anymore until we have a cleansing and a liquidation of all of this malinvestment, all of this massive debt, all of these distortions that have built up? They don't know, but they're presuming they know, and that's why they're printing money, because they're trying to get the economy to be at the potential growth rate that they uh, 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 decree as possible. They uh, said yesterday, we're going to give the, the statement yesterday, and this is why I call it QEI, is we're going to print money and we're going to ne never stop until the unemployment rate comes down to where we want it. Well, how do they know what the full employment rate is in an economy that has been as damaged, impaired uh, as this one has been? that we all know the full, the unemployment rate doesn't even measure anything. I mean, it's just like uh, nonsense coming out of the BLS. Everybody knows that. People are dropping out of the labor force. The denominator is uh, stagnant. Uh, and so therefore, they're using a statistic that most sensible people would never use even to manage their own little investment portfolio. They're trying to run a $15 trillion economy uh, on a number that's that uh, flaky and shaky. And so therefore, they have done something that I find really outrageous, and that is yesterday, it was almost like, you know, Congress is making us do it, okay? Yeah, we're printing a hell of a lot of money. We're sucking up everything in sight in terms of the treasury market, the MBS market. Yeah, we're, we're probably trying to levitate the Russell 2000 and so forth. But we have to do it because we have a mandate from Congress that says maximum uh, employment uh, and price stability. Well, the point is, if you ever read that, it doesn't say you need an 8% unemployment rate or 4% or 5.8762% unemployment. There's nothing in there. That's an excuse in order to simply take charge, take control, uh, become uh, the monetary politburo of the U.S. economy. So uh, this is a worse kind of Keynesianism because there's no check on it whatsoever. It's just uh, 12 uh, people uh, utterly out of control. And therefore, I believe, and this is my last point, that it's leading to a constitutional crisis. Um, it is going to be more evident to people with each passing day that you do have an unelected uh, dozen people running this economy ruining the capital markets, crushing savers, allowing Washington to run massive debts without any carry cost, creating windfalls, crony capitalist windfalls for all the smart speculators who have uh, a little inside knowledge about what's going on, turning capitalism because 
They're, print, they're creating free money. They're turning the free market into a doomsday machine. And uh, I think when that begins to uh, uh, settle in and people realize how out of control this is, uh, and hopefully the Republicans will finally wake up after all these years of sleepwalking, um, maybe uh, the issue will come uh, to a head. I'm not counting on it. I'm somewhat of a pessimist. But yesterday was so far off the deep end that maybe it's the wake-up call the country finally needs. Thank you.